No one goes to action movies for realistic fighting, because realistic fights are all dirt humping, arrest records, and embarrassing handcasts. But when a movie drifts too far into fantasy, we end up with something that looks more like a college freshman's interpretive dance choreography than anything that could realistically incapacitate Vin Diesel. In Fast and the Furious 6, Dom Toretto and Brian O'Connor have betrayed the U.S. government to free international terrorist Owen Shaw in order to save Dom's sister and Brian's wife, Mia. Uh, Dom's sister and Brian's wife are the same person. More specifically, in this particular scene, Dom knows that he has to win this fight quickly and angrily, and he makes a very interesting choice. No! In good conscience, I can't make fun of this scene right now. I simply know too much. As a Fast and the Furious franchise fan, I know that Dom is not a fist-flailing, physically first-rate Fruit Loop. He is actually a punch artist experimenting with the form. This moment marks the beginning of his flying head punch period. See, we've already established that Dom can easily shoulder punch through drywall, and we know that Dom is not only proficient with the back punch, but knows the proper mid-air form to take to prevent his spine from being mashed into powder. Bored by the mundanities of day-to-day -day punching that us peasants find so stimulating, Dom keeps his mind limber by challenging himself to punch through barriers and broaden the horizons of his chosen an art form. This kind of depth is why he's my favorite movie character. An alternate theory is that the Fast Six screenwriter watched that scene from The Lost World where the Pachycephalosophilus Osiris headbutts a dude through a jeep and thought to himself, man, wish I was writing a movie about dinosaurs so I could rip that off. <laughs> It'll be fine. <laughs> When The Matrix came out in 1999, it was the coolest thing anyone had ever seen because it allowed us to watch anime-style fight scenes without having to be the kind of person who watches anime. But the thing about that fight style, and we didn't realize this until the sequel, is that if you just shoot it slightly wrong, it stops looking like SNM ninjutsu and starts looking like an overweight dude rolling around in an invisible hammock. This is a $150 million movie, and they spend 14 seconds ratcheting up the tension with helicopter shots and swelling music, only for Larry Fish to awkwardly fall half a foot in the air and then tap that dude with his big toe like an eight-year-old earning his blue belt. Martial arts and movies are a ballet, but we're not watching actual ballet. It's something that someone should have told Keanu Reeves' stuntman right before this moment. Looks like an exercise the doctor gives you after you hurt your back at your Taekwondo class. He's just lucky that random Agent Smith flew in from off screen for no reason, or that would have looked really dumb. And I would keep going, but at this point in the movie, I realize that there's a scene where Neo throws one Agent Smith at a big pile of Agent Smiths. There's a sound effects like a bunch of bowling pins being knocked over, and it made me wonder if maybe I'm the idiot. I don't know how many people in the world are in the same blood sport situation as me, but let's try this out anyway. Growing up, I'd always heard of a movie starring Jean-Claude Van Damme titled Bloodsport, but I never actually got to see Bloodsport because my parents assumed it was too violent for me because it was called Bloodsport. So I filled my little kid brain with fantasies about what my favorite time cop might be able to do in a universe called Bloodsport. Then I grew up and never actually got around to seeing it, but those fantasies persisted. And I never, in my life ever, imagined that there might be a scene where Jean-Claude Van Damme's character, who I assume is named Bloodsport, kills a man by punching his balls into his brain. I don't want to know anything else about this movie. Never tell me. I only want my childhood fantasies and that crotch punch to live together forever perfect. In fact, if you go into the comment section and try to tell me the plot of this movie, I will punch your balls into your brain and f***ing kill you. That is a real legal threat that I'm making right now to you, Brad. Terminator 2 is one of my favorite movies because it's one of everyone's favorite movies because it's Terminator 2. In fact, you could use Terminator 2 to make the argument that we don't even need to make movies anymore because we have Terminator 2. At this point, Sarah Connor is locked in an insane asylum because that's exactly what a functioning society does to people who try to blow up factories because they think robots from the future are trying to murder their children. One orderly, who we can only assume is particularly dedicated to his job of making the world a better place, manages to get the drop on her and yank the syringe of Drano out of her hostage's neck. Sarah retaliates by bashing his nose and then... <laughs> what? It looks like she shoved him off a swing set because she had a crush on him. Look at his doofy legs. She almost pushed him completely upside down. I would be totally fine if we threw in some matrix logic and he did a full-on backflip there. Can we do that? Does anyone know, does anyone know how to do that? Ricky O, The Story of Ricky, is a 1991 Hong Kong action comedy horror drama soap opera monster movie about a man with superhuman strength battling the Yakuza in prison. Remember how I said that The Matrix is what happens when you try to make an anime movie with humans? I was lying to you. The Story of Ricky is what happens when you try to make an anime movie with humans. Later on in that, right, Ricky is fighting another one of his nemeses in the prison yard, and that guy named Oscar manages to cut Ricky's arm, and Ricky rips out one of his own veins and sews his wound shut with it. Oscar is so blown away by this explosion of raw masculinity that he performs harikari, an ancient ritualistic suicide in which you gut yourself horribly. But it's a ruse, because Oscar then reaches inside his own stomach, pulls out his intestines, and tries to choke Ricky to death with them. Which I guess means it's not really a ruse, because he actually guts himself, but Ricky retaliates by punching him across the prison yard, and then they keep fighting for a while. And all that stuff is amazing, but Let's stick with the intestines thing for a minute. As Oscar wraps his own guts around Ricky's neck, the warden clearly shouts, All right, 
You got a lot of guts, Oscar. All right, you got a lot of guts, Oscar. Not only is he cheerleading this guy on in the middle of a prison yard Mortal Kombat, but he's doing so A, like a Little League coach, and B, with a dad pun. This movie's amazing. Spider-Man 2 is the last time anyone did or ever will make a great movie with Spider-Man in the title. It features, hands down, the coolest superhero fight in the history of filmmaking on top of a train that, if we're being picky about New York geography, probably doesn't exist, but who cares because it seems great. And right in the middle of it, Doc Ock, in his most magnificent feat of mad science tomfoolery, rips a hole in time and throws Spider-Man through it. I know it may seem a bit odd to criticize physics in a Spider-Man movie, but look at me. Look at me. That can't have happened. Ock and Spidey are traveling on top of the train. They and the train have the same relative velocity. Then Ock throws Spider-Man forward in the direction that the train is traveling, meaning Spider-Man's speed is now the train speed plus whatever speed Doc threw him at. And yet, after Spidey darts through that walkway, he appears behind Doc Ock, and Ock is surprised to see him. What? What? If you think I'm making a big deal out of nothing, keep in mind this is the turning point in the fight. Spidey is getting his ass handed to him by Dr. Octopus's clear intellectual and physical superiority. The odds are evened not by a clever strategic gambit or a show of strength, but by a hole in reality that appears specifically to give Spider-Man the upper hand. You may as well have had Doctor Who warp in and go all woo-woo and brilliant and wave his sonic screwdriver around like a lunatic. My point is, Spider-Man is a hack. Winning superhero fights through luck and temporal trickery rather than through grit and determination and the superpowers he was given by that spider bite. He deserves none of the credit here, and I have no idea why this isn't a bigger deal to people. That got out of hand. Uh, Spider-Man 2 is fine. That scene is probably fine. It, I mean, who gives a shit? Uh, like and subscribe. Sorry about this. Or, I mean, just, you know, come talk to me on Twitter.